The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. I want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 13. We'll be in John chapter 13 this morning. Joy is an elusive thing. It seems that those who often we would expect should have it, don't have it. You know, the people who, who are able to do whatever they want, they, they have loads of money and, and maybe less responsibilities. Those people who would expect to have it seem oftentimes to not have it. That's obvious every time you hear about somebody winning the lottery. You, you've, they've done stories where they've followed those people, and, and ultimately when people win millions and millions and millions of dollars, it does not bring them joy. Oftentimes, it's found in the places that you would least expect. You go to a, a poor village in Guatemala, and you see people who have what seems like joy. And it's, it's one of those things, it seems, that when joy is pursued, it's never found. We can pursue it as much as we want, but if, if our goal is our joy, then we never seem to find it. And what happens is that you find true joy when you ignore it in pursuit of something greater. The problem with our pursuit of joy is not that God does not want us to have it. You get that? That God wants us to be joyful. He didn't create us to be miserable. He's not a cosmic party pooper up there who's just trying to reign in our parade all the time. God created us and he wants us to have joy. He wants us, the Bible says, to have a life that is more abundant. That our, he said he came that our joy may be full, that we may be rich. And, and when he's speaking about rich there, it's not wealth. It is rich in, in joy, um, in peace, in what really matters. That we may always abound. That our lives will be filled with purpose and, and meaning and hope and joy. And the problem with our pursuit of joy oftentimes is, is that it's done very selfishly. And when you think about that, when we are living our lives for our joy, and we look in light of what the Bible says about sin, how can we think that a selfish pursuit, doing this for my own good, is going to ultimately lead to joy when I have a God who created me for something, and in pursuing my own joy, I'm neglecting pursuing him. He's created us to pursue him, and so when we find ourselves doing that, when we pursue what's so much greater, then we will find true joy. And so our quest this morning will be to uncover exactly what we must know and what we must do to be extremely blessed by God. And what I mean by that is in John 13, verse 17, Jesus says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And so the the word there, happy, is makarios, and it means to be supremely blessed or fortunate. And so Jesus is saying that there's something that we need to know and something that we need to do, and if we do those things, we'll be supremely blessed or fortunate. It sounds like true joy. And so what I want to do is get into this text and figure out exactly what Jesus is talking about, because the answer would be very different than I think what the world would give. You don't find true joy in the same place that the the secular person would say you find it. But it's also, I think, somewhat different than maybe what we think when we first read this passage. I think there's a lot of times that we read this story and we come away with, all I have to do to find true joy is to serve people and humble myself. And certainly that is an aspect of it, and that's important, but that's not all of it. And so I'm looking forward to getting into John chapter 13 this morning. If you know the book of John, you know that John chapter 1 to 12 covers the three-year ministry of Jesus. And then in chapters 13 to 21, it covers the final four days of Jesus' life and then his resurrection. And so this is, I mean, John is very focused in in the time he gives because this time of Jesus' life is what he came for. It's his mission. In John chapter 20, verse 30, John writes, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so John says, there's so many other things that Jesus did and he said that I could have recorded and they would have been wonderful to read about. But I had a purpose and my purpose is that you would believe that Jesus is the son of God and that in believing you would have life through his name. 
And so the reason that John took so much time on these last four days of Jesus' life is because that's where the life through his name comes from. That's what's the most important part of this story. That's what Jesus came for. And so let's look at John chapter 13. We'll begin reading in verse 1. John writes, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. If you're familiar with the life of Jesus, you understand that the feast of the Passover here is the Last Supper. And so the Last Supper is just about to take place, and this is an occasion where Jesus transformed a celebration that the Jews had been celebrating for over 1,400 years, the Passover meal, where they they celebrated the fact that on that day in Egypt, when the angel of death came and killed the firstborn of all the Egyptian boys, that if they would kill an innocent lamb and put blood on their doorposts, that the angel of death would, would go over, it would pass over their homes. And this is a picture of of salvation, right? The innocent is killed so that the guilty may go free. And so it's it's all pointing forward to an event that's, that's about to happen. Jesus just said his hour had come. And John is making that point because you remember at the start of the Gospel of John when Mary says, hey, Jesus, do this miracle for us. And Jesus says, woman, my hour has not yet come. The point is that His hour was not those three years prior. All of those three years were for the sole purpose of being signs that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. But the purpose for which he came wasn't just to do miracles or to teach. It was to go to the cross. So now he knew that his hour, that his time had come. And then the Bible says something really amazing here. It says that he loved his own and that he loved them unto the end. And the word end there can be translated um, uttermost. And the idea is he loved them, not just his duration. It wasn't just a a long period of love. It was an extent. He loved them. He loved them so much. And so John frames this passage by starting to say, Jesus loved these men. He loved his own so much, and he loved them until the end, to the uttermost. Verse number two. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So here John skips what what seems to be a large section, a large period of time. When you compare John's gospel with the other gospels, the synoptics, you have the whole story about um, the the Lord's Supper being instituted. You have a lot of different events that happen between the beginning of the Supper and this time. And so now the Supper's ended, and we have kind of a strange statement that the devil put something in the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Christ. And the role of the devil in Judas' decision is an interesting conversation, but it's, I don't think it's going to be very helpful to where we're going today. What I did hear one person say that just kind of summed up what, what's going on there, um, A. Schlater said, the heart that is inspired by the devil wills what the devil wills. And so Satan willed it, Judas was responsible, he did it, and it was ultimately all part of God's sovereign plan. And so that's how we understand that verse. Verse number three, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself i got to say, the contrast between those two verses is staggering. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hand. That he was come from God and he was going to God. And so, I mean, Jesus is fully aware of his deity. He's fully aware of his authority. He knows who he is and, and he knows everything about himself. He knows how glorious he is. And so this is a statement about the divinity and the glory of God. And the very following statement, I mean, it just doesn't seem to follow. If, if verse 4 said something like, he stood upon the table and accepted worship and obeisance from all those presents, that would make sense, right? Jesus knows he's, he's divine, and so he accepted all the worship that was due to him. Or if we had verse 4 that says he arose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel, if the, if the previous verse said something like, 
Jesus knew that he was in the presence of the, most, of the 12 most important men of Israel, and he knew that he was just a servant, and so he arose from supper and girded himself with a towel and, and washed their feet. Then that sentence would have made sense, right? So, but, but the opposite in both cases is completely true. Jesus is not just some lowly servant. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And these 12, these 12 men are not the most important men. In fact, we're going to find out they're pretty terrible men. And certainly not smart or impressive in any way, shape, or form. And so here he takes the king of kings and lord of lords, stoops down. He takes a towel. He girds himself with it. And, and, and even in the act of girding himself, what he's doing there is he's just signifying that he's, he's becoming a slave. That he's making himself a servant. And he washes their feet. Verse number five, after he had poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Can you imagine if you were at this supper? And, and we know that back then they had kind of really short tables and then they would lay down beside them. And so now Jesus gets up from laying down, or maybe he was sitting and teaching, but he gets, he gets up and he walks around behind the disciples. He's got the towel on. He is their master. He's their Lord. And he's stooping down with his basin of water, and he's dipping it into the water, and then he's, he's washing each feet of the disciples. Now, you've got to understand, their feet, their feet were disgusting. They, they walked around in filth and, and, and sweat and, and just a whole lot of gross things that we shouldn't talk about in church. That's what they're walking around in all the time. And so they have this disgusting, gross feet, and now the master is one at a time in silence going around and washing their feet. And, and I kind of just wonder how many feet he got to before he got to Peter. Can you imagine how awkward that would have been for the disciples to just to see their master and their Lord now doing the job of a slave? Maybe knowing that they should have done it? I mean, I, I know that this job was below the work of a Jewish slave. Jewish slaves weren't allowed to, to do this. You couldn't make your slave wash your feet. Okay? But now, I mean, they're in the presence of, of God. And they didn't think that they should maybe wash his feet? Instead, he's washing their feet? What an, what an incredible, I, I mean, powerful time this would have been. And, and super awkward for them. And so, in verse number 6, finally, Jesus comes to Peter. It says, Then came he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Peter finally says what they're all thinking. Lord, how are you going to do this for me? Why would you be the one to wash my feet? And Jesus said unto him, What I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. (laughs) And I read that and I thought, what an annoying answer. (laughs) Right? I mean, Peter, you don't know now, but someday you'll you'll figure it out. It's like, no, Jesus, just tell me what's going on. Like, uh, how is this making sense? And Jesus says, Don't worry about it now, Peter. You'll understand someday. And so Peter says unto him, verse 8, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And the word never is not forever. It's never going to happen. I'm never going to let this happen. And Jesus answered him and said, If I wash thee not, then thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And this is one of the funniest conversations in all of Scripture. Because Peter is just adamant that there's no way that, there, that he's ever going to let Jesus wash his feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, then you're, you don't have a part of me. And I, I'm trying to figure what Peter's thinking. Like, does, does Peter really think that Jesus is going to disown him just because of the physical act of washing his feet? I mean, obviously Jesus is presenting a spiritual principle here. He's teaching them something. But Peter doesn't get it. And so he thinks, well, if, if making my feet is clean, is, is helpful, then Jesus, give me a full-out sponge bath. I mean, let's, do the, let's go the whole way. Wash all of me. Jesus says, Peter, you're so dense. I don't, I don't need to wash all of you. This, it's, it's not about your feet. And as we think about this, uh, of Jesus stooping down and washing their feet, there are so many verses that come to mind. So many times the washing of, of our sins can be compared to the washing of the feet here. And I I thought of Psalm chapter 51, verse 2, when David says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, if you remember in John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's, it's this picture of water, uh, of the washing away of sin. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so clearly, Jesus is doing something more than just washing some dirt off people's feet. He's, he's teaching this wonderful spiritual lesson for them. But Peter, he does not get it. Verse 10, Jesus said unto him, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, you are not all clean. And here we learn, I mean, we assumed it before, but Judas is there. Judas Iscariot is present as Jesus washes their feet. And so that means that Jesus took a towel, did the job that was below a slave, to a man who had already who had already started the process of betraying Jesus, who had already set this up that soon he would leave, soon he would go get a, a group of temple guards and would come, bring them to Jesus, kiss him on the forehead, and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knows all of that. It says it right there. He, I mean, he knew that they're not all clean. He knew that Judas was about to betray him, and yet he still gets on his hands and feet, and he washes Judas's feet. What an, what an unbelievable Savior. What an, what an incredible example for us. We, we, we honestly fall so short of this. And, and I know that it's true in my own life. Um, but this is, I mean, this is who our Savior is. And this is who we're called to follow. And so here, Jesus, who could have very easily turned the water to hydrochloric acid when he washed Judas' feet. Remember, he did it with water and wine. He could have done it. He didn't. He just washes his feet. That's, that's what I would have done. That's what I put in there. <laughs> Verse number 12. So for after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was sat down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you. Do, do you know what I've done? And the answer is a resounding no. No idea. They have no clue. Verse 13, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Jesus says, if I am willing to sacrifice, if I am willing to serve like this, if, if I'm your master and your Lord in the truest sense of the word, the master and the Lord of the universe, and I'm willing to humbly serve you, surely you should be willing to humbly serve others. Surely you will follow in my steps. You will give for others. You will live out the truths that you say you believe. And so Jesus here gives us an incredibly important example. And then in verse 17, he says, if you know these things, Happy are you if you do them. And my fear is that we will leave this place. And then many times we read the story and we, we think that Jesus said, if you wash, if you know that you should wash feet, happy are you if you do it. Or if you know that you should humbly serve people, happy, happy are you if you go out and you humbly serve people. Because the truth is, that's not all that Jesus is saying here. That's not all this, that this story entails. The disciples needed to first know with something about Jesus. What they needed to know, what we all need to know, is not just that humble service will produce happiness. Because that's not always the case. I'm sure that you've been in a, in a circumstance where you've humbly tried to serve somebody, and it didn't work out well for you. That person didn't appreciate it. That person used you. It happens all the time. And that doesn't feel good. That doesn't produce this, this intense joy. There's something else going on here that we must know, and it's something about Jesus. This is not simply a moralistic anecdote. Jesus isn't just giving us this, this cute little story so our morals will be better, so we'll act better. 
This is a picture of something that is much, much more important. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a moral command here. There absolutely is. There is something we need to go out and do because of this. But, there's, but, but the knowing part, there's something that's, that's this motivation that's so great that we must know first. And so the challenge of this passage is not finding exactly what the application is or what to talk about. The challenge is, is choosing which applications to focus on. And throughout the study of Peter's life, if you've been coming on Sunday nights, you know that we've been looking at how Jesus discipled Peter and how Peter was discipled by Jesus. And so we're going to continue down that path um, in our application this morning. I want you to notice a few things about the attributes of Jesus in this story. Number one, we see the omniscience of Christ. We see his omniscience. We see that he knew all things. He enters the room with knowledge that this is his final meal before he is crucified. No matter how many times he has told them, all of those around him will not accept the truth that the Messiah will be put to death. They don't get it. Every time he says it, 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 they, they change the subject or they deny it or they just don't want to hear about his crucifixion. But Jesus enters this room with all of these guys who all think they're about to enjoy this, you know, nice little celebration. It's just going to be a regular meal, and Jesus is fully aware of the true circumstances, that this is his final meal. Jesus knew that his hour was come. And what he does here, I think, is he prepares his disciples for what's about to happen. We see the omniscience of Christ, and number two, we see the grace of Christ. See, he's fully aware of his deity, he's fully aware of his mission, and and he's also fully aware of the future actions of every person in that room. I mean, the Bible says the Father gave him all things that he, that he knew um, that he was going from God, and then he was from God and he was going to God, and he knew all about those men that sat before him. He knew about Judas. It wasn't a shock what happened. He knew when he was washing Jesus' feet, he was washing the feet of the man who had already set in motion the, the plan to betray him. He knew when he washed the rest of the disciples' feet that eventually they would all, for fear, run away, that they would hide themselves in the upper room, maybe in the same room. I mean, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was standing in a room full of cowards, full of people who would betray him or run from him, full of Peter, who's going to deny him three times and one time in front of a servant girl. I mean, curse his name. He knows this is about Peter as he washes Peter's feet, and yet he does it. This is the grace of Christ, giving what what they don't deserve. And so here is Christ, the omniscient, glorious King of Kings, with intimate knowledge of the past, the current, and the future failures of each person in this room. And there was lots. You go through the the Gospels, and you find the the disciples failing often. And this is, I mean, it's not like they failed at the crucifixion, and then eventually they never did anything wrong again. He knew their future failures as well. He knew all about them. And now the God who created the heavens and the earth stoops down to wash the dirty, smelly feet of the people he created to do a job lower than a slave. The one who spoke water into existence now takes a basin of water to wash the dirt he created off of the disciples he created. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples who would leave him. He washed the feet of Peter who would deny him. He washed the feet of Judas who would betray him. We see, number three, his incredible humility. His incredible humility. And isn't it just, isn't it just shocking? I mean, there is not an account in, in history of a leader ever serving his people like this. Like doing the job that's lower than a slave. But Christ was willing to humble himself. The hymn writer said it this way. He said, The Son of God, his glory hides with parents mean and poor. And he who made the heavens abides in village homes obscure. At his voice the angels stand, around whose throne they meet. Now stoops prepared on bended knee to wash his followers' feet. If you can get a high view of Christ, and you can understand that that in eternity past he had angels worshipping him, that, that he is the truly king of the universe, that he set everything into existence, and now think of that glorious king of kings stooping down. It's, it's, an, it's a shocking picture of humility. 
We see his humility. And number four, we see his love. And John begins this whole section with he loved them to the end. And this is just an incredible example of that. There's a, a storybook Bible that we read to our kids often. It's the Jesus Storybook Bible. And what's the, the phrase that is used very often in the Bible to describe God's love is that God loves them with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And, and it's so true. His, his love wasn't dependent on, on their sin, on their character, on, their, on the quality of who they were. He loved them because he chose to love them. It was just this incredible love that couldn't be changed by the fact that he was in a room full of failures. Do you know that in John chapter 13, verse 34, just a few verses down in the same chapter, the same discussion, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This whole, this whole thing that Jesus did, it certainly is a, a great example of humility, but it was motivated by love. He loved them so much, he was willing to serve them in this way. In fact, in John chapter 13 to 17, where Jesus is giving the final discourse, the word love is used 31 times compared to eight times in the previous 12 chapters. I mean, what happened on the cross was all about love. And it's all about love very clearly for these people who are so unworthy of that love. We see his love, and number five, we see his instruction. He teaches them. He prepares them. He uses this analogy of something that is physically wonderful, an example to follow physically, but he uses the analogy to teach this incredible spiritual truth about what's coming. It's not just about feet. He provides for them this picture of what it means to have your sins washed away. And so this is Jesus. And then, and then just to put this all in perspective, notice Peter and the rest of the disciples. What were they like? What's going on in their heads and their hearts? Well, let's, let's see for a second. We find that they're in the midst of failure. They're in the midst of failure. At this very supper, in Luke chapter 22, verse 24, Luke writes, There was strife also among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. So last supper for Jesus, right before he goes to the cross to die for the sins of the world, all of his disciples are arguing about who is going to be the greatest. They're in the midst of this argument as all of these things transpire. In the midst of failure. Not only that, they're currently failing to serve Christ as he deserves. I mean, they should be the ones washing his feet. And so they're failing in that regard as well. It's Jesus who rises from supper and takes the towel and, and girds himself. These guys, they, they were, they were mess-ups. Okay? We need to get that very clearly because... I know that later on in the Bible and we look at at church history and we look at them, we say, wow, those disciples, they did wonderful things. They were incredible people, right? I wish that someday I could just live my Christian life like they did. That I could have the commitment that they had. Can I tell you something? They were nothing. I mean, these guys were flesh and blood. They had temptations. They were arguing about who's greatest. They, they're not better than you. Do you get that? I mean, you're, I guess the right way to say it is you're as bad as them. They're as bad as you. They're as bad as me. And I'm going to put myself worse than you guys. So, I mean, we are, don't ever get the picture that, that, that what the disciples did later on was, was a somehow reflection of, of their character or how great they were. It wasn't. What they did is a result of the grace of God. Completely. Utterly, it was his grace that transformed them. And the good news for you and for me is that his grace is the same. That he he loves not just them to the end, he loves us to the end. All those that are his. The Bible doesn't even say he loved his own until the end. To the uttermost. His grace is not different now. And so getting the picture of who they were, I think is really helpful for us. They were in the midst of failure. Um... They were blind to the teaching of Christ. They didn't get what he was trying to get to them. Peter's comments make that abundantly clear. And they were on the brink of their greatest failure. They they were about to leave this place and do the worst thing that they would ever do in their lives. That that they would run away and hide from Christ when he needed him most. That they would betray or deny their Savior. This is who they were. 
these men were in desperate, desperate need of cleansing. And the dirt and the sweat and the filth that was caked on their feet was only symbolic of what was going on inside. That, that's what was in their hearts. See, that this whole thing, it's not just about feet. So when Jesus stooped down and he cleansed their feet, he was painting a picture for them of the work he was about to do on the cross when he would provide a way for their hearts to be cleansed. He saw their need, he stooped down, he humbled himself, he sacrificed his dignity, he was willing to go through shame and humiliation so that he could make sure that his disciples could be clean. So he took their dirt, he took their sweat. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And Jesus taking on the form of a servant this evening is just a picture of what he was about to do on the cross. If we miss the gospel in the story, we miss the whole point. If we miss the gospel in the story, we are right at the level that Peter was at when he said, wash all of me. We We just don't get it. What Jesus is teaching them here is that they must be cleansed by him. That's it. I mean, that's what they must know, that they need cleansing from him. There are three problems, I think, that we run into when we encounter this truth, that we must be cleansed by him. When we read the story, I think think what happens is some of us, we think that our feet are already clean. We say, yeah, okay, Jesus, I understand. We look at that room, we look at their failures, we look at these men, and we think, Yeah, okay, they definitely need to be cleansed by Christ. But not me. I'm fairly clean as it is, you know? I'm very careful to take a bath often. I, you know, I watch my tongue, I watch my actions, I try and treat my neighbors myself, I try and keep golden rule, I follow whichever of the Ten Commandments I can remember. I mean, we we try and do some pretty good things. And so some of us think, yeah, okay, I get what Jesus did on the cross, and there are people certainly that need to be forgiven, they need to be cleansed, but not me. That's, that's a problem. And do you know what's funny about the way, what Jesus talks about when he talks about those, those people, the people that, that are righteous within themselves? He says he can't help them. There's, there's not a secret to this. There's not like a, okay, well, this is what I'm going to say to convince you. No. I mean, if, if we think that we're righteous within ourselves, Jesus says, well, he didn't come to, to make those who are not sick healed. He's, he's the great physician. And if you don't think you're sick, he's not going to heal you. And so recognizing that we're sinners, understanding that that we have broken the commandments of a holy God, and that someday we'll stand before this holy God and give an account, I mean, recognizing that, that's that's on us. I mean, the Spirit will convict us, and and I pray that he does that. But listen, we need to get that we need cleansing, that we need what they needed, that we're no better than them. So it's a problem when we start thinking that we're already clean by ourselves. The second problem, I think, that we, that we find is that there are some of us that think that we could never be clean again. Some of us that think, no, listen, you don't know my past. I've done worse things than what the disciples have done. Some of us that think, really, that, that Jesus, his blood cleanses people from sin, absolutely, but just not you. And can I tell you something? That couldn't be further from the truth. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. From all sin. Every single person in this room and every single person in that room find ourselves equally condemned by a holy God. This is really a hard thing for us to get across, but you know James says that if we keep the whole law and yet offend in one point we are guilty of all, the Bible doesn't, it doesn't put levels on sinners. It's not like, okay, this, this person is a level three sinner, and so they get to heaven, and level four just doesn't quite make the cut. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, that all of us are guilty, that we're all condemned. And so the good news is that Christ came to die for sinners. 
But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What love is, the love that's shown here, is not that God loved people who were lovely. It's that God loved wicked, awful sinners. And so if you find yourself in that category where you say, I'm not sure that, that Christ's death is sufficient for me, then it is. It is. He can save you. He can cleanse you. There's no person that's outside of his ability to save. But you must repent. You must repent of your sins. You must turn from them. You must turn from your self-righteousness. You must turn from whatever it is you're clinging to. And you must turn to Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. Some of us think we're clean. Some of us think we're too dirty. And then the third thing that I think we run into, the problem that I think we run into for believers often, is that some of us are prepared to allow Jesus to, to wash our feet, but we would never consider washing the feet of another person. Some of us, we've read this story. I think it's a wonderful example. But when it comes to service, I'm not going to do it if it's just a little bit you know, gross or if it's, it's, it's going to take a little bit of sacrifice on my behalf. I tell you something, if that's where you're at, you just don't understand Christian service. You don't understand discipleship. Following Christ is being like him. It's, it's doing the things that he did. I'm not advocating that we have a foot washing service after church today. No, there, I mean, there's not a need for it. If there was a need for it, sure. But I am advocating finding people who have needs and serving, even if you don't get paid, even if it's hard work, even if it's, there's no recognition. Service. Don't just think that it's okay for us to accept all the, the grace and the, the wonderful blessings that Christ gives us and never follow in his steps. Christ expected his disciples to follow. He certainly expects you to follow as well. The truth is, sometimes the people you serve won't always be nice to you. And if our joy was hinged upon them being nice to us, we'd be in big trouble. But our motivation here now is the sacrifice of Christ, his cleansing of us. That's what we know. And so when Jesus says, if you know them and you do them, it's you must know what he's done for you, and then you must do likewise. You must sacrifice for others likewise. The motivation is the cross. Sometimes you won't encounter really nice people. Sometimes you won't get paid. Sometimes the work is gross. Sometimes you'll have to do a job that other people should be doing. So what? Serve. After Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And there is a joy that comes with service. But Jesus was truly speaking about a lot more than washing feet. And you will never find joy in just service until you know and accept the greatest act of service that was ever done on your behalf. Until you know the gospel, until you understand that Christ died for you, that, he, that he's given his life to save you, until you've trusted in his death, you'll never find this joy. 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The love the wash, that washed the filth of this world off the feet of the disciples is a picture of the love that would ultimately send him to the cross. And it's a picture of the love where Christ dies on the cross to wash the filth of this world and the sin in your heart off of you. How can we be supremely blessed by God? How can we find joy? Well, a couple questions. Have you had your sins washed away by the blood of Christ? It can't come otherwise. Have we been washed by the blood of Christ? Have we been forgiven? Have we been cleansed by him? Number two, does your life reflect this act of sacrificial love? Do you truly try and follow your Savior? And I believe if we can, if we can get to the point where we say yes to both of those questions, we will find the joy of what we need to know and what we need to do that Jesus says will make us supremely blessed. Let's pray.